this is our crew patch, and uh, here's the patch on the cake they make us uh, traditionally at our uh, last meal on Earth before we go uh, into space. We usually get cranked up about three hours prior. We had a really relaxed schedule this flow. Uh, we woke up about 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning, and uh, we're going to launch at 9.48 at night. Here's the first picture was of me in the suit-up room. Here's our pilot, Joe Edwards. Payload commander, Bonnie Dunbar, who also served as uh, mission specialist number three. Jim Riley, uh, mission specialist number one. Mike Anderson, MS number two. Andy Thomas, our long duration crew member. Uh, Salazan Sharipov, our Russian cosmonaut who served as uh, one of our mission specialists. Here's the walk out to the orbiter. Again, we uh, walk out and get strapped into the vehicle about three hours prior. Yeah, uh, this is what on greets it. us on our way out to the pad. And it's simply spectacular. Uh, the main engines light about 6.6 uh, 6 seconds prior to lift off. The computers check them out. If uh, they're all okay, then the solids are given the command to fire. That was the twang. The whole ascent takes about eight and a half minutes, and the first two minutes you get most of your thrust out of the two sod rocket boosters that you can see so clearly there. Uh, the vehicle shakes quite a bit under the solids, and uh, together the three main engines and the two solids put out uh, around seven million pounds of thrust. Yep, here's a good picture of the uh, sod rockets coming off the uh, orbiter. And again, once that happens, then you've got about six more minutes uh, before you get to orbit. This is a view inside the cockpit. Uh, all the shaking, the main engine just lit. Again, about six seconds prior to liftoff. Then the big flash from the uh, sod rocket plume and uh, a little more severe shaking comes from the sod rockets. If you look carefully out our windows, you'll see a cloud layer that we went through. Here come the clouds. And again, the flash was from the uh, reflection off of our own rocket plume. And then one more flash. This is a real attention getter when the sod rockets come off and uh, a lot of debris goes past the forward windows. So in the next six and a half minutes, we ride on the main engines, and that's when we get most of our orbital velocity. Uh, once we get in space, we open up the payload bay doors. Uh, we start turning our rocket ship into a, a laboratory. This exposes the payload bay to the vacuum of space and also lets us glimpse uh, Earth out the back windows of the orbiter. Back in the payload bay, you can see the space laboratory in the back, and uh, there are several experiments in the payload bay. We had 23 science and technology experiments distributed throughout the shuttle, uh, all operated by different members of the crew. Back here in the space hab, we had both science and technology experiments, as well as all of the cargo that would be eventually transferred uh, back and forth to the Mir. Of course, we had many mission objectives. Uh, our primary one was to exchange the crew members, uh, Andy Thomas and Dave Wolf, and along with that, the cargo that you can see shown here. The Space Hab ha is a multi-disciplinary, uh, objective type of uh, pressurized cargo holder. Uh, we can perform experiments from around the world in it. In this particular scene, uh, I'm setting up a radiation experiment from Japan called the Real-Time Radiation Monitor. It actually looks at the radiation that we're exposed to in an anomaly in the Earth's uh, magnetic field called the South Atlantic Anomaly. This is part of it called the detector unit. also had some uh, biospecimens on it that looked at the effect of radiation on uh, regeneration. Over on the right, those spheres uh, are part of another radiation experiment. Here we're using materials of different thicknesses to shield uh, from the radiation, determining what the best materials are to be used in future space station and exploration vehicle design. On the flight deck, this digital camera pointed out over the window and was connected to a computer, which students from across the country commanded to to take pictures of the Earth. We also used a computer, a laptop, to look at our human performance or reflexes in space as a function of the environment. In addition to things that we looked at in space, we could look at things on the ground with some of our payloads. In this case, the mechanics of granular materials was actually looking at what happens in soils in earthquake and landslide terrains where soils can fail. 
by modeling these features on, on orbit, we are able to take advantage of the lack of gravity, which overprints most of the forces, so we're able to look at the small forces that work in these systems. Well, on flight day three, we got set up and started doing the rendezvous. The rendezvous actually began uh, with our, our launch, and uh, we basically chased the, the Mir around Earth till we catch up to a series of burns. This depicts the way we rendezvous with Mir. We come up from below, and we uh, try to position ourselves to stay within the green corridor. This is a view from the, of the orbiter from Mir, and you can see uh, clearly some jets firing as we close. Again, a view out the top window. Uh, we rendezvoused at night, and uh, this works out uh, to be a lot better for visibility. We use cameras, and uh, sun glaring off parts of the mirror can uh, make our cameras bloom. This is Dave's view. It's a real pleasure watching you guys come out of the sky. And the actual docking itself. Couldn't even feel it from inside. Um, and this is the view out the back window, and as Mike has said previously, uh, there's no view quite like looking at a space station and the Earth uh, attached to the orbiter. This is a view through the hatches uh, into Mir, and you can kind of see some anticipation there on the part of Anatoly and Dave. Actual some regret and some happiness when that hatch opens. <laughs> the hatch opening, it's uh, a Russian superstition not to shake hands across the hatch. It uh, brings you bad luck or across the threshold. So I'm going to pull the uh, Russian commander Anatoly into the uh, space shuttle. It's really quite emotional to uh, uh, rendezvous and dock and see friends at such a remote uh, outpost. Again, that's Anatoly, the Russian Mir commander. There's Pavel, the Russian board engineer on board Mir. He's a man who remembers where everything is in the whole station. Well, these two really uh, know how to live in space. Uh, <coughs> Anatoly's one of the most experienced uh, space travelers in the world. It's interesting, uh, Anatoly was also Bonnie's uh, commander when she was in uh, Star City training. She spent about 13 months at one point. Uh, and then Dave, <laughs> you know, we've got him back on American soil. Good to see you, Commander. And then the first thing we do is uh, get together for a meal. We have something to eat uh, with the Russians. They exchange a few gifts uh, before we get uh, settled down to, to work. Here we are uh, in the Cristal module, and you see the air hoses that provide ventilation very important in zero gravity not to have dead spots. And we can reroute these hoses as necessary to change the airflow uh, depending where the hot and cold spots are in the vehicle. That's a yellow oxygen tank you just saw on the left. There's a spacesuit on the right. This is a storage area. Uh, and you can see that we have to transfer all the 9,000 items down this corridor to get into the rest of the Mir space station. It's not very wide. There's the area I slept in above. We pull ourselves with sets of these bungees. You see that black bungee on the top. So uh, we have prepared this area before the shuttle dock and cleared it. It's actually much more crowded than this uh, during actual life. Uh, storage lockers on the left, panels on the right. There are systems and storage behind all these panels. There's a treadmill above. That's really the floor. You might say we were upside down. We're approaching the, dot, the node, the main node to which all the modules, six main sections of the station, station are attached. Now we're turning, literally turning, rolling into the base block. These modules are attached, uh, so orientation is not necessarily the same in each module. And there's Andy. And we're spending our time uh, ha transferring information, uh, making sure he knows where things are, and giving him the tips I've learned in four and a half months in space. And here we've turned to the Perota module. It's our main laboratory. It's mostly packed up at this point. I'd spent the last uh, two to three weeks uh, uh, packing up items. So uh, uh, final preparations. There's the computer, very important as you with many purposes for a laptop on orbit, including watching videos, uh, which I had some, not much time to watch. Uh, but they were interesting as uh, they were, they impacted me strongly as an attachment to Earth. Uh, somehow the movies seemed very important. 
I think it was there in inventorying the materials and equipment that he's taken back to Earth, and here he's brought some of the stuff to Space Hab on uh, the orbiter. And we transferred approximately 9,000 pounds of, of equipment, which covered all of Dave's equipment plus all the stuff Andy was going to be using for the next four months. And that was approximately 1,400 items all told. In zero G, you had the advantage of being able to maneuver and carry the uh, items just about any way you want, as Terry was showing here. And one of the people who really helped out here was uh, Salajan Sharipov, our cosmonaut who was part of our crew. His knowledge of the mirror was invaluable in being able to transfer all that material. And even at the height of transfer, when we had stuff temp sewed all over the space hab, we were still able to operate as both a as a freighter and as a laboratory. This is uh, uh, module one two. You see some of the delivered things. This is uh, Jaradain. There are about 15 on the station that used for uh, latitude control. This is our pressurization unit. <laughs> This is a bioreactor, and many medical discoveries will, that will be made in space that can't be made on the ground. Here we're growing three-dimensional cancer tissue, breast cancer, in a way it can't be grown on the ground, and this is a great tool for cancer research. Well, this is a microgravity laboratory, and I'm way back in the back there, but working on a ex technology experiment that is going to be used for space station, looking at <laughs> contaminants in uh, our air, about 23 different compounds. It has a lot of uh, technological applications to the ground as well. Uh, we also carried the first telemedicine instrumenta instrumentation package mm -hmm. to orbit, which allows doctors on the ground to monitor crew members, for instance. Uh, here, uh, Terry's looking at my eye. He's taking my blood pressure earlier. We can send EKGs or heart monitoring data to the ground. It's also being used as a remote package in rural areas across the United States. Well, as they say, all good things have to come to an end, and after five days of docked operations, we exchanged the traditional gifts and said our goodbyes. Uh, Terry and Mike here prepared to close the hatch as Anatoly closes the hatch on the mirror side, followed by our closing of the hatch on the orbiter side. We undock, and this view is from the payload bay, from one of the payload bay cameras. You can see the two docking adapters separating there. And then the next scene is the view that uh, we had from the orbiter through our centerline camera and through the overhead window. You can see the docking target there that we use to align the vehicles during docking and during undocking. It looks nice and peaceful in those pictures, but it's a flurry of activity on the flight deck as we take a look at the attitude of mirror and the attitude of the orbiter position and uh, adjust the relative velocity between the vehicles see the view here that the mirror crew had as it separated. As we backed away from mirror, we moved to a position about 240 feet below them so that we could fly around the mirror to do a photographic survey, taking still photography and the video that you see here. And as beautiful as this scene is, it frankly just doesn't compare with the view that we had there looking out the overhead window seeing uh, this beautiful spacecraft slicing through the horizon of the Earth as we flew around it. On the right side of this picture, you can see the perota, or the uh, spectra module, which is the module that was damaged in the collision. You can't quite see the damage to the solar array in this view, but in the next view, I believe you can. You can see the Soyuz spacecraft at the bottom of the node there, the black and gray uh, spacecraft that's uh, docked to Mir and used by the cosmonauts to, uh, to rendezvous and dock for uh, entry. And in the case of an emergency escape, mm -hmm. comforting the nodes there. As we continued our fly around through our last 90 degrees or so, this is a picture that you would have seen from Mir had you been there with us, and we're prepared to uh, do our separation burn to move away from Mir, uh, enter a different orbit, and uh, do continue our preparations for coming home. In this view in the middle, you can see the, in the middle of the spacecraft, the space station, you can see the node, and uh, above that is the perota module, and below that is the uh, crystal and the docking module in orange down below it. To the left of the node is Kavant 2, and to the right of the node is the specter module, and if you look from left to right, the first array that you see on top there is the array that was damaged in the collision. 
And uh, the last view here is from Mir as we uh, burn to enter a new orbit, and you can actually see the, uh, or could see the lights of uh, cities below the Earth in the picture. As big as that looks, our new International Space Station will be three times as much volume inside and increase our science productivity. After we left the mirror, it was back to science. This is a Canadian-built experiment called Orbiter Space Vision System. It's going to use this to build an International Space Station. It actually uses the orbiter's cameras, sort of like electronic eyes, to help you determine the exact position and orientation of grappled payloads. We carried four gas cans, or getaway specials, on board, two from Germany, one from the University of Michigan, and one from the Chinese Academy of Science. This is how you take your weight in space. This device takes advantage of Newton's second law of motion, actually allows an astronaut to measure his mass. It's going to be important for long-duration spaceflight members who want to keep a close track of their health and fitness. Yeah, I lost 20 pounds. <laughs> we don't know why exactly. This is another experiment that we flew up there called CETUS. This was a closed aquatic ecosystem. On board this aquarium, we had over 200 sword tail fish, a variety of snails, and aquatic plant life. Here's Salajan taking a few brief moments to look at the Earth out of one of the many viewports. We have to use our time real wisely up there. Nine days without gravity takes a toll on your legs, so it's important for us to exercise, keep in shape. The shuttle provides a great platform to uh, view the Earth. Here you see Terry using some of our cameras to take some pictures of the Earth below. We have a lot of computers on board the uh, shuttle, and we use them for a variety of things. Here you see Joe typing out an email message to his wife back home. He's actually on the ceiling of the orbiter while he does this. And first-time space flyers just cannot resist playing with their food. Here you see Joe using a bunch of M&Ms to simulate the expansion of the universe. Strawberry drink can be used to demonstrate some pretty advanced principles of fluid physics. You know, in the absence of gravity, surface tension alone is enough to keep a fluid in a perfect sphere. If you blow on it, you can cause it to wiggle, but it still stays together pretty nice and, and neatly there. Of course, the best part about an experiment like this is when you're all done, you can actually drink it. But when we were finished with all the science, we put everything away and closed up the space hab and prepared to come home. Just like when we went up there, we opened up the payload bay doors. Now it's time to close the payload bay doors, get our final good view of the Earth below, and get ready to say goodbye. You know, we sort of do this with mixed emotions. We're kind of sad to go home and, and leave space. We've had a really wonderful mission, had a great time up there, and really enjoyed doing what we did. But at the same time, I think everyone was sort of eager to get home and share this experience with their family and friends and their loved ones and really tell them what it was like up there in space. This is a view over my right shoulder in the commander seat during entry. You can see the Earth down below us out the, the left windows. Uh, we go from 25 times the speed of sound, or about 17,500 miles an hour, down to a landing speed of around 230 miles an hour. Uh, we usually overfly the landing runway and then uh, descend in a, a left turn down to line up with the runway to touch down. Our descent path is about uh, six times steeper than a commercial airliner's. And again, we're decelerating uh, the entire direction. Here we are in the left turn down at the Kennedy Space Center. Got the world on our side here in about 300 knots. Can you see the heads up view here in just a moment? Yeah, here's a view out the pilot's window. And it gives you all your descent, uh, glide path, your airspeed, your altitude. We're doing almost 300 uh, knots, going through 11,000 feet. And you can see the runway overlay. Well, it's, this view really gives an appreciation of how quickly we're descending. And about 2,000 feet, we pick up the nose of the orbiter to ease the descent rate. So our pilot Joe put the gear down at 300 feet. It's about 15 seconds prior to touchdown. view out the back. If you look carefully, you can see some of the smoke from the tires get caught up in the wingtip vortices. Touchdown's around 210 miles an hour. Chute gets deployed at about 200. Even though the runway is over three miles long, it's, it's nice to have something like that drag chute to bring to a stop. You can 
continue to roll out, and then you'll see him jettison his uh, shoot at about 70 miles an hour. That hatch was open. The smell of that grass was almost overwhelming after four and a half months of process <laughs> air. And then after and 138 orbits and 3.6 million miles and a little over nine days, we come to a wheel stop and Terry gives him the call. And that about wraps it up. <laughs>